Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship today. We're honored that you are here, and especially if you're a visitor with us, I want to make note of <clears throat> these cards that you can fill out at any point and place in the offering basin as it goes by. These are information cards for guests. We'd love to know who you are and have you come and meet with us and tell us about yourselves. Fill these out. And then these are prayer request cards as well. It's our great privilege to pray for this body on Mondays especially, but throughout the week. And this helps us know how we can pray for you. So please take advantage of that. Just two announcements for you for today, and they both have to do with this evening. We'd invite you to come back at 515 for what we're calling a diversity discussion and follow up to our Gospel Priorities series. We want to know as a congregation how we can encourage one another better. That begins at 515 over in Murphy Hall right across the street. And then this evening, <clears throat> we'll gather back for worship at 630 and we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper together. It's an opportunity to give to our Mercy Fund during that offering as well. And then after the service, you can come up front here. We'll have elders available to pray for you for healing, uh, emotional, spiritual, physical healing in any way. We cherish that opportunity to see the Lord work through the prayers of the saints for healing. So that's this evening. We hope you'll come back and be with us. Let's now prepare our hearts for worship as our choir sings to us. I invite you to stand. The God who comes to us with healing in his wings invites us to worship him this morning. 
May the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Sing to God. For him, his name is the Lord. Lord be with you. With your Let us worship God. great Father, Son, Holy Spirit, triune God, one God in three persons. You are holy, holy, holy. Not a person in this room has any business approaching a holy God. We are not holy. Every part of us has been affected by the fall. We don't even know the depths of our sin, and yet We can rush into your presence this morning because Jesus the Son was holy for us. He lived and he died in our place. We stand righteous. Those who have trusted in him by faith stand righteous before the throne. You look on us and our record is clean. And we love you for it. And we want to sing your praises and we want to know your love more. Fill our hearts with joy this morning, O Spirit as we recognize the depth of our sin and the even more incredible nature of your grace. Capture our hearts and minds and wills this day and cause us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray it in Jesus' name and God's people said together, amen. Christian, I ask you, what do you believe? I
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Turn now in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 18. For our Old Testament lesson, if you need a Bible this morning, there are some in the pew rack in front of you, and you can find this text on page 1,203. The theme of the sermon will be on God's mercy in the midst of our suffering and our need for repentance. We see the overwhelming grace of God to those who repent. And here in Jeremiah 18, the prophet Jeremiah is given this image to show us how eager God is to forgive us if we repent of our sins. Read with me, beginning Jeremiah 18, beginning in verse 1. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand. O house of Israel, if at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, Then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. Now therefore say to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, This is what the Lord says. Look, I am preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways and your actions. This is, oh, the grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of our God stands forever. This is a promise for believers that if we repent, the Lord will forgive. Which this means that the reason we go through confession every single Sunday is so that we can come to the throne of grace again and hear the Lord say to you, your sins have been washed away. I forgive you. So we don't have to run and hide We come boldly. I invite you now, if you're able, let's kneel and confess our sins to the Lord. Please join me in this corporate confession of sin. Gracious Lord, you are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. We do not want to disobey you or dishonor you. Therefore, we ask you to deliver us from tolerating the things that you hate. Forgive us for being proud, for being dishonest, and for pursuing or permitting harm to others. We repent of our scheming hearts that devise wicked plans. It is so easy for us to pursue evil and give in to temptation. When pressed, we easily misrepresent the truth. We create disunity in our church, homes, and community because we are self-seeking and arrogant. 
Our hearts are so easily deceived. We pray that you would grant us repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. In your mercy, forgive our wickedness, rebellion, and sin. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As you've confessed your sins, the Lord responds with these words of assurance. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive, until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his prophets, of his holy prophets long ago. This is your assurance. Would you stand now as we rejoice in the grace that is given ours in Christ? me as we continue in prayer. Thank you for that reminder, Father, that your mercy is strong. It's stronger than the darkness around us. It's stronger than the darkness in our own hearts. It's stronger than evil. Thank you, Father, that your mercy is also tender, caring, near to us. It's of a healing nature. Your mercy draws us near to you. And we thank you for your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that demonstrates that mercy in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Father, may we live out of that mercy. Teach us what it means to live lives full of repentance that turn from sin and the darkness and run toward you and live in fullness, the fullness that you've promised. We thank you, Father, that in this city we have hope only because your mercy is strong enough to defeat evil. In this city we have hope only because your mercy is near enough that you would change us. You would give us courage to speak the truth in love. Thank you, Father, that this week the commission has ruled that the strip clubs downtown will not uh, continue with extension of their license. We know this is a small step, Father, but we thank you for our neighbors in Old Town, our friends in Old Town. We thank you, Father, that 
as we seek to be a caring community, that we would respect one another and we would also, Father, protect one another from evil. Make us people who protect those who are taken advantage of through sex trafficking. We protect those, Father, that are vulnerable to addictions and to temptations. And Lord, we pray that our city would be a healing city for families and a safe place for children. Thank you for our campus outreach ministry. We thank you for their retreat this weekend. We pray for those 273 students that are in Atlanta with campus outreach, many from Augusta University, Payne College, and USC Aiken. We pray for some, Lord, to come to know Jesus Christ and his healing power. We pray, Lord, that you would turn others from dark paths, give them the joy of repentance to be renewed in you. We pray that for all of our missionaries as they share the gospel around the world. Bless Shirley and Roger Brown as they work in Kenya through Africa Inland Mission, as they give care to not only missionaries, but those who've experienced trauma, as they give counsel to those who have been displaced and, uh, Father, that uh, feel uh, unworthy of your love. Use them, we pray, as they seek to create clinics that will bring healing and sustain healing even after they finish their term there in Africa. We pray for those that are sick. We pray for Ben Munns, especially for Betty and Ed as they visit Ben in Washington State this week. As his health declines, battling cancer, Lord, we pray that he would continue to glory in the gospel. We thank you for even the movement of healing in Sylvester Brown's eyes from the successful surgery this week. Continue to heal him as he seeks to glorify you. And we pray with expectation and hope, Father, that you would uh, heal his sight. Thank you that he glories in you and trusts in you. We pray for others who are battling illness and cancer. May they glory in you and trust in you. Father, thank you for the words that Jesus gave us as he taught his disciples to pray. We use those words as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated.
peace of the Lord be with you all. Let's share that peace with one another. Please be seated. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 13. I had to put on my running shoes. I went to shake hands with those in the overflow. I thought they needed greeting and uh, the peace of Christ as well, but they did have the door lock coming back in, so. <laughs> Luke chapter 13, we continue in Luke's gospel. Reading this morning, it's found on page 16, 19 in the Bible provided for you in the pew. We'll hear how judgment and judgment from God is good news. 
Now there were some present at the time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. This is the word of God. Thanks be to you, O God. Let's pray together. We ask you to open our eyes, Father, and teach us by your Holy Spirit what it means to live lives of repentance. We need your help even not only to study, but to know your gospel and then to live our lives in light of your truth. Empower us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The idea of the fear of judgment has become less and less important to religious people as well as ir irreligious people in our society. No one wants to think that God holds us accountable. And if God holds us accountable, most in society either hold this with disdain or suspicion. The new, the new salvation is individualism, says Robert Bella, sociologist at the University of California in Berkeley. In his book, The Habits of the Heart, Bella says that we hold to one sacred ideal in this nation, and that's the sacredness of the individual. You be you, be true to yourself, follow your heart, be the best version of yourself, find yourself. The problem, Bella says, with this type of radical individualism is that we hold only one thing sacred and there's nothing else sacred except this one thing and that's our individualism. I was talking with one of our members who's a part of the judicial system here in Augusta and he made the observation, no one wants consequences for anything these days. Parents don't want their children to face consequences for their actions. Children don't really want to believe that their decisions and their choices face any negative consequences. And we want to live in a world that we believe is insulated from consequences. We want our radical individualism to allow us to do whatever we choose to do without any social or personal consequences. The Bible teaches that you cannot be a flourishing human being if you don't hold other things sacred, not just your individualism, but you have to hold other things sacred, in particular, to hold God's voice as sacred. Many of you are members of this church. I was talking to someone between the service and I said, I just want to tell you, by virtue of the fact that you're a member of a church is a declaration that you hold something else sacred than simply your own individualism. You declare that not only you need God's help, but you need one another to fulfill the commands of God. All too often, our culture is trapped by radical individualism. What the statistics do, do show though, is that while Americans do not fear judgment, we do fear misery. Economist Arthur Okun developed the misery index in the 1980s and it was a formula that looked at 
inflation, that looked at um, uh, personal spending, and that looked at uh, employment factors, and determined uh, what they called a misery index for how Americans were prospering or not prospering. The American Psychological Association has gone on to add that not just economic, e economic challenges, but also challenges of fear of the future, challenges of fear of terrorism, pain and strain relationships add to this misery index. I'll ask you this question. When you're facing misery, do you see that God may have a plan for that misery? When you're facing difficulty or even consequences for bad decisions, decisions that other people have made for you or decisions that you have made, is there a way to see that is part of God's plan. Well, this text teaches us that God has a plan for judgment and God has a plan for suffering. And we see three things that the text teaches us about judgment and why judgment is good news. First, we see that judgment awakens us to our need for God. Secondly, we'll see that judgment points us to God's remedy. And then third, judgment is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Judgment awakens us to the need for God. It points us to God's remedy. And judgment is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. First, judgment and suffering. It's judgment and suffering awaken us to a need for God. You notice in the passage, these people are asking Jesus about this suffering. As well as Jesus is talking to them about their sinfulness. And they're asking the question, are these Galileans being judged? Apparently Pilate sent some secret spies into the worship at the temple and those spies ended up killing the worshipers. These are asking Jesus the question, are these Galileans being judged? If you are Messiah, Will you judge Pilate for these actions? Is anybody going to be held accountable for this atrocity is the question that they're asking. Jesus brings up another incident that is more of a catastrophe. It says that there's a large tower next to the Pool of Siloam right there near the temple. The tower collapsed. Many were hurt, but 18 people were killed. They're obviously asking Jesus the question, when you see that kind of suffering, are they being judged? Or is there a reason for this suffering and it is, is it God's judgment? Job's friends asked that same question or they told Job that, Job, you're experiencing suffering because of your sinfulness. You recall in John 9 where Jesus was healing a man who was born blind. They asked Jesus the question, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? All too often we draw a, maybe a direct line between suffering and sinfulness, between judgment and des deserving that judgment. Jesus talks about sinfulness and he talks about suffering. But he doesn't say that those incidences are messages about those who've experienced suffering. <laughs> he says it's a message to all of us, those that are listening. It's not a message about those that experience these consequences. It's a message to us all. And that message is that there is something worse than experiencing these kind of this kind of suffering and experiencing these kind of consequences. He says, unless you repent, there is something worse than even these situations. And that's that you would perish, that your soul would perish. There's something worse than difficult circumstances. And that is that your soul would perish. So when Jesus says, were these worse sinners? Or were these more guilty? He's speaking of the nature of every person marred by sin. But he's also speaking of the judgment 
that all deserve. When he says, worse sinners, more guilty, he's saying, look at these circumstances. You're tempted to say they deserve this. Or will those that did this in such an unjust way, will they deserve any kind of retribution? Jesus is saying sinfulness deserves punishment. Three things we need to see here directly. We are accountable to God for our disregard of Him and our disloyalty to Him. That's really a description of sin. Sin is a disregard of God and it's a disloyalty to Him. Sin is a commitment to being loyal to the darkness rather than to the light. And we are accountable before God for our disregard. Secondly, we deserve God's judgment. And even the circumstances that we experience are mercy from God. Even when you walk through difficult times, those are merciful because we deserve God's judgment. And then lastly, we will never experience true and full salvation until we embrace the reality we deserve God's judgment. That's why judgment is good news. It's good news because it alerts us and awakens us to our need for salvation, to our need for God. I recall when we were starting the ministry down at Georgia Southern, Sandra and I were living in Statesboro, Georgia, and I met some guys on a basketball court and I invited them to study the Bible with me, investigate what it means to have a relationship with God. Well, several guys came and they brought some of their friends. At the end of the Bible study, I noticed that one person that I didn't know, uh, his name was Kevin, he was lingering slowly on the way out. So I asked him, I said, what brought you to the Bible study? Are you interested in learning more about how to have a relationship with God? He said, no. Mark, my roommate, brought me. He said, I'm actually not interested at all and I don't plan to come back again. Well, I thought, I obviously can't offend him too bad no matter what I say, but maybe I'll try to <laughs> provoke a little discussion. I said, well, I'm gonna pray that something would happen so dramatic in your life that you would come back or at least you would turn to God and seek God. He said, well, I'm not coming back walked out the door. The next week, I didn't see him uh, between uh, that time and the, the next week of the Bible study. Well, he came walking in the next week. But this time he looked very troubled. He sat in the same place. He didn't speak the second meeting the same way he didn't speak in the first meeting. But he waited to the end of the meeting. And when the Bible study was over, he said, can I talk with you? I said, sure. He said, I want to know how to become a Christian. I said, well, tell me what happened. He said, well, he said, I've been angry at God. My mother died when I was 10 years of age. And any time anyone brought up an issue that related to God, I tried to run. And when I found myself, found myself in that Bible study, I realized there was no place to run. But I knew I didn't have to come back. But he said, what you said to me just stayed in my head. I'm gonna pray that God would do something so dramatic in your life that you would become interested in Him. He said, I thought about that the next day and the next day, and he said, I went home for the weekend to see my girlfriend, and I went with a friend over to a party that uh, some of our friends were hosting. And he said, I rode with my friend who uh, picked me up in his truck, and we went over there to the party. When he was ready to leave, he said, it's time to go, but I wanted to spend more time with my girlfriend. So he said, can you find another ride home? And I said, sure. On his way home, he was hit by a truck and he was killed. He said, I should have been in that truck on the way home. And I realized I have no other choice. <laughs> Running from God will only lead me to greater isolation and hurt. I'm gonna to run to God. And we began to talk about how God's judgment and even experiencing suffering awakens us 
to our need for God. Well, not only does judgment awaken us to our need, judgment points us to God's remedy. And you see in verses six and the seven, verses six and seven, you see God's remedy in the interaction between the judge and the advocate. Now, in the parable, it's speaking of the owner and it's speaking of the vine dresser. But I think that what you see is that the owner is acting as a judge. He owns the land. He is merciful in his mind. He's allowed that tree three years or six cycles as a, fr as a fig tree would blossom twice a year. He's allowed it six cycles, but he's honest. The tree is unresponsive. The tree is dead and the tree needs to be removed. He says, cut it down. It's obviously not healthy. But then you see the vine dresser and he functions as an advocate. And I think what we see in this story is that God is both loving and just. Many people have a difficult time understanding how God could be both loving and just. But God's justice grows out of his love. For yes, God is angry with sin and he's angry with evil. But if God were not angry with sin and evil, then God would not be loving because it's not loving to overlook injustice and to ignore evil. And so God is loving, but he cannot overlook sin. And so he brings judgment. But notice how the vine dresser advocates for the tree. Many th saw this as Israel, the tree, and surely at that time it was still God's mercy to allow Israel to turn to the Messiah for salvation. But it's a reminder to us that God waits patiently for us as well. As that advocate makes his case to protect, to be patient, to bring life back to these dead places. It makes me think of Genesis chapter 18. You recall Abraham, shortly after God gave Abraham that vision of a covenant promise. Abraham, I will be your God. I will be the God to your family and I will bless your family and all the families of the earth will be blessed in you. You recall that Abraham's nephew Lot has gone off to Sodom, a despicable place, a place that will probably not only kill Lot, but also destroy Abraham's family. And what you see is that Abraham, as a type of Christ, moves in as an advocate. He says to the Lord, and in many ways, operating off of this covenant promise that you've called my family to be a blessing to the families of the earth, he says, Lord, if there are 50 righteous in that nation, will you spare the nation? And God says, yes, if there's 50 righteous I'll spare the nation. Abraham says, well, what if there's 45 righteous? Will you spare the nation? I said, yes, if there's 45. Well, what if there's 40? Well, what if there's 30? What if there's 20? What if there's 10? Abraham is acting as an advocate. It's a type of Christ where he's interceding as God has declared that he will judge Sodom for their injustice, for their oppression, for their wickedness, really points to us how Jesus advocates for us. It says that in the parable, the vine dresser says, give me a little more time. Let me work on the roots. Let me save this dead plant. It says that he uses fertilizer Eugene Peterson in his book, Tell It Slant, I hope you read Eugene Peterson, he just recently went to be with the Lord. I try to read everything that Eugene Peterson writes. But Eugene Peterson talks about how God's plan is to take the refuge and the waste. The fertilizer is just manure. It's just to take the dirt and the refuse and to bring about resurrection and life. 
What is the refuse in the dirt that God places on our roots to bring back life? It's the death of his son. Jesus himself says, do not judge them, judge me. Do not destroy them, destroy me. Do not neglect them, neglect me. Do not punish them, punish me. Our advocate says, I will become the manure. I will become the refuse. I will become the penalty for their sin that they might be brought to life. It's really a picture of God's work of resurrection. And when you practice repentance, you're practicing resurrection because you're practicing and declaring, God, bring back those dead places in my heart. God, heal me of those dirty places. God, renew me and make me in my heart fruitful again. Fill my heart with love, with joy, with peace, with patience, with kindness, with goodness, with gentleness, with faithfulness, with self-control. The fruits of the Spirit that we cannot produce in ourselves. Make my tree fruitful again. When you practice repentance, you're asking not only for forgiveness, you're asking for healing. And you see in the passage here, healing does two things, or repentance does two things. Yes, it gives us access to God. And yes, he accepts us and forgives us. And when you submit to God, that's turning from self to God. That's the healing of repentance. Jesus said that the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. In Acts 20, Paul says that we preach both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So first, repentance is a turning from self and submitting to God. But Calvin talks about repentance as to be a lifestyle. He describes total repentance as a longing to be healed. It's every day saying, yes, God, thank you for forgiving me. But it's also saying, would you heal me? Would you cleanse me? Would you make me new? Work the power of the resurrection into those dead places of my soul. Bring back life. Give me joy. Fill me with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's a refinement, as we read in Jeremiah, like the potter who takes the clay and he's making that pot. He's refining it to be what he wants your heart to be. That's the power of repentance. It transforms us into his image. I love A.W. Tozer in his book, The Pursuit of God. He has a little prayer. It's called the repentance prayer. It goes like this. I repent of my sinful preoccupation with visible things. The world is too much with me. Thou hast been present and I've known it not. I've been blind to your light and reality. And then he says, open my eyes that I might see you in and around me. That's the repentant prayer. It's not simply accept me and forgive me. It's make me new. It's change me. It's give me life in dead places. It's give me love in harsh and hateful places. It's give me peace in anxious places. It's give me joy in sad places. It's giving me faithfulness in places where I've left God's love and care. I know you're familiar with Revelation 2. It's the writer, John, his vision, Jesus says, write this down. And to the church at Ephesus, he says this, I know your deeds. You do not tolerate wicked men. You test the apostles and those that are not. But this one thing I have against you, you've left your first love. 
Remember therefore and repent and do the deeds that you did at first. Repentance is a reminder that God has loved our soul and that love will heal our soul as we run not from God, but we run to God. It's a refinement of our soul that transforms us, that brings us the fruit of the Holy Spirit. After the service, if you go to the website, there's a link that shares the story, Laura Story's story. Laura Story Elvington is worship pastor or worship minister uh, at Perimeter Church in Atlanta. She's also a songwriter and she wrote a song called Blessings. But there's a little short video that explains why she wrote that song, Blessings. Laura's a friend and her husband, Martin, is a closer friend. Martin was a baseball player at Wofford, went on and had a very successful IT business. And after they got married and he moved to Atlanta, he began to have headaches and they found out that he had a tumor. And Laura tells in the video how they prayed for his healing. And uh, they also knew that if he didn't die, even the surgery would probably mean that it would render Martin very limited in his ability to function normally and effectively because of the damage that the tumor had done. So she talks about in the video, could God give me a blessing even if he did not answer my prayers? Could God heal me even with unanswered questions in my life? And this is what she writes in the song. What if your blessings come like raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if the trials of this life are your mercies, your mercies in disguise? I think Laura is seeing a lifestyle of repentance as a lifestyle that refines us. Like that potter that's refining that pot to make us people who say, Jesus, you're really enough. Jesus, you're really glorious. Jesus, you're all that I need, even in the midst of my pain and suffering. Jesus, you're all I need. Last week we talked about that the call to discipleship is the call to the fellowship of the burning heart. We see today the call to discipleship is the fellowship of the healed heart. And our hearts are healed as we live in repentance. Judgment is good news because God longs to heal us. Let's pray together. Father, if there's anyone here that doesn't know the saving, healing power of Jesus, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. You say to all of us, unless we repent, we perish. And then, Father, would you teach us to live a lifestyle of repentance, that we would run to you and trust you and hope in you, even when we feel that we don't understand why the circumstances are going the way that they're going. Even when we don't understand suffering, may we believe that your mercies are new every morning. Heal us that we might run after Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen.
Raise your hand to receive God's benediction. Believer in Christ, go in the assurance that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Amen.